My guest today is Mayase. I've known Mayase for some time now. It's been years. She's my sister from the mother continent. <laughs> if I describe it that way. Yes, and, sure am. <laughs> and we both live out here in on the what what's it called? Down under? Down under. <laughs> yeah, all the way the other side. <laughs> uh yeah, and Oh, Mayase recently wrote a book or published a book. When you say recently wrote, it sounds like... Well, I know, right? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also, it's the one-year anniversary. So it, it, it's kind of like 12 months ago it, it was published and uh, 18 months ago it was written. Maybe that's it. <laughs> yeah, wow. And congrats on that, hey? Congratulations. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I've been trying, um, I still say I'm trying. I think I'm past trying now. Like I've been doing a bit of writing and developing my own writing craft. So I highly respect writers, like uh, crafting a story and uh, it's almost world building. It's like building a whole new world of experience that can suck somebody in and take them on a journey. Yeah. It's not simple work. It's like, <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's a but lot yeah, of so, work. Yeah. But anyway, and I, my essay, I'll, I'll introduce yourself and then we get into it. <laughs> yay. Thank you, Clayton. Thank you for having me as well. I, I'm excited to actually talk about this book because it's its one year anniversary. But it's also been a journey of writing. I feel like these stories are me. So sometimes you kind of hear about writing, like you were saying, where it's like it's it's world building, it's storytelling, and it's people immersing in your world. And sometimes I think what I found through this journey, the hard part was allowing myself to write for me and knowing that people would see so much of me in my stories. Because cause, cause ultimately, you, you, you know a lot about the author by their stories. Um, so it was a journey. It took me eight years to publish at least the first story. And then uh, the book came like six months after the first story was published. But I think a lot of it was because at some point when I saw my old manuscript, it was very vulnerable. It was so much pain. It was so much, you know, the migrant journey has so much toughness and it was all of that. And because of that, I just felt mm, wasn't the right time to release that much pain to the world. <laughs> uh, and then there's a point when it, it felt right and Muchalo was born because it felt right. It had connection to my roots. And the vision I had for the book had evolved. And so the pain didn't feel like pain anymore. And then it, it just became a joyful piece to share my life, my world um, with a lot of people. And a lot of people just go like, seriously, I've had Asian migrants, you know, we're African. So sometimes I can be like, yeah, Africans get it. Um, but I've had Asian migrants. I've had migrants from other places of the world who go, yeah, this is me. I feel exactly like this. And yeah, it's been great to just know that it just doesn't relate to me. The migrant journey relates to anyone who moves from their motherland and is trying to connect to their roots or trying to find what their roots are. Uh, so it's been a great journey for me. And aside from that, I'm a techie. <laughs> I'm not making JK Rowling's money from my books. So I, I work in technology, which is also exciting because again, technology is about the future and building uh, stuff for people that they're going to find valuable, which is also an exciting part of the world working in technology. Wow. Yeah. Like I resonate with all that. And I think, uh, it, it's so true what you're saying, um, about like getting to a place where you kind of, uh, it's like you need time to get to be okay. 
mm. with yourself and what what you know what you you've experienced and what you've gone through and so when you're describing that pain in the manuscript and allowing it to sort of like settle and get to a place where you're okay with it and i think yeah like you, you for me it it really reminds me a lot of like you know it's it's all part of grow, growing up right like you grow yeah. up and then uh you get to this point whereby you you no longer have you no longer hold shame of what has brought you to where you're at yeah mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you kind of it, it's like you you go yeah, that, that was me, and it's all part of, it's still part of me. It's still part now. of me, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I wouldn't be me right now if, if that had not happened. I hadn't gone through that, yeah. yeah. And and, yeah. and I think once 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 you make that connection, then you're at a point where by like, look, it's 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 my story. Welcome, enjoy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and it's an interesting thing that you say there. So I have been since I moved to Australia, this is my 20th year. And I think this year as well, I've had a lot of thinking about, you know, the 20 year journey that is in Australia. I came to Australia as a student. I came as a college student. So I did my college, I did my university in Australia. Basically my whole adult life has been shaped by the Australian landscape. And then at some point, you know, when you're, you know, 19 and coming to Australia and you're thinking about, you know, the world, you really think, I just want to get an education. I want to hang out with my friends. You, you really think you just want to live your best life. Like that's all you think about. Um, but the older you get, you then realize, oh crap, my parents are not in Australia. My grandparents are not in Australia. The only generation I know is my generation and the younger people because my friends now have kids and I'm an auntie and I adore my ne nieces and nephews, but that's it. I'm the adult in my generation. I have no one <laughs> who's older than me who's going to, you know, pass on the so-called wisdom and that. Not saying I don't have older friends. I, I have older friends. I know people who are older than me, but from that generational thing, I don't have that connection. I don't have a generational heritage in this context. And that's how Mochalo came about because I was thinking about my connection to Zambia and what my kids, someday if I have kids, what my kids' connection is going to be to Zambia because their grandparents mm -hmm. are in Zambia. And um, just as a bit of background, I grew up with my grandmother. My mother was a teenage mom. So a lot of my early years were with my grandmother. She was my first mother. And so the book is also homage to her. It's kind of like it's um, migrant life stories inspired by Bemba Proverbs. My, my grandmother was a Bemba. Bemba is a tribe in Zambia, northern Zambia. And so the attachment was like, how do I get all this wisdom that my grandmother had filled in me that until this point <laughs> in the last couple of years, I, not that I didn't care about it. It didn't really sit in me until I realized that I had to disconnect and that wisdom would never, it's finished. Unless mm -hmm. I give it to my kids, it's finished. That, that, that line is completely broken because they are not here. They're not in Australia. They'll never be in Australia. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I might as well write some stories that are based off the teachings that my grandmother used to give me. And basically I was a naughty child. They were, she used to use those proverbs to scold me. Right. <laughs> but as an adult, I'm like, yes, she was trying to teach me stuff. This was her way. Um, and that was it. I was like, how do I connect to my roots now that I'm very far away from intergenerational, you know, my, my parents are not in Zambia, my grandparents are not. Even the semblance of parents, people in my parents' generation who are Zambian in Australia, I don't know them. I don't hang out with them, right? Um, and so that was it. Let, let me connect to my roots. And this book is a way to connect to my grandmother 
but it's also a way of like, you know, other younger Zambians who are growing up here who have no idea of these things, proverbs that we have had for centuries that they don't die. At least they will have something that they can connect to. So that was the first like connection. And I, mm. when I re kind of like thought about that connection and decided to write, I was like, all right, so I'll pick a couple of proverbs that some that my grandmother used, some that I just remember to honor her. And then I'll also write it from a perspective of the journey that you have here. Yeah. What your life here, what your life here looks like, what my life has looked like, what the life of my friends has looked like. And so I'm kind of joining the root. I'm also joining the current because a lot of people still go through everything that I write about in the book as part of their migrant journey. So it's kind of like connecting those two felt right. Uh, and the book was born. <laughs> no, that's, a, that, that's, a, that's a beautiful journey to it. And it's like, you know, hearing you talk about that. So, oh my God, there's so many things that I've, I've been taking notes and that I want to touch on a little bit. It's like, you know, you, you mentioned your heritage and then you, you took it to you, to motherhood, you know, like with your mom and then your grandma. It's like, it's like what I was saying earlier, the motherland, right? It's like the, there's a mm. whole mother thing of like, this is your first experience at this in, in like at all those levels. Uh, yeah. This guy, I, I, I listened to his work. Um, it's a Canadian guy. Uh, Professor John Viveki, and he makes mm. a, a joke around um, uh, mother tongue. It's like, you know, we use this term mother tongue, but usually like in some cultures, like especially like where I come from, your mother tongue is the, the you know, local language mm. of your father. Mm -hmm. And you're like, how is it? Why do they, like if you come from like, a, if your parents come from different ethnicities, it, you should take the one of your mother. It's like, no, 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 you take the one of your father because that's the lineage you're trying. Yes, that's the lineage you're going through. And, yeah. And, and but it's still called the still yeah, called the mother tongue. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because because it's it's the it's the first language. Mm. Right. And then mm. and then he takes it up and says, just like you have a mother tongue, you also need a mother religion. And that's why your your parents would pass on to you what they've been practicing and making sure they've passed it on really well. Because mm. all that is mothering you into life, right? Yeah. And so, so yeah, you're touching yeah, a bit yeah. of, about that. And then you, you, you went into the wisdom, right? The wisdom in the culture and how, if you see what's happening now, like we're losing all that stuff. And I'm telling you, I'm raising two young children here and it's like, it's so prevalent. Like you can see how different they are. Yeah. And like you, 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 you can see that you can't speak to them about the things that, you know, you grew up with. And so now I'm putting in an effort to try and uh, do that. Like, you know, teach them the mother tongue, right? Yeah. <laughs> and language is one way as well, yeah. right? Language yeah. is one way. Definitely. And in the Passing context of values. Australia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I think that, that that's the, the, the thing as well. If you sit and think about it, like I was saying, like, your journey would be a lot similar to mine. Different because you came as an experienced, skilled migrant as opposed to a student. But the, the, the fact that your generation, like you and I, your parents are not here. Yeah. So if you think about it long term, you are the grandparent of the next generation, right? You are the person they're going to be like, hey, that old man and his sayings, my God, do you know what granddad was saying that, <laughs> right? Like, but literally like, this is where I think about myself. I'm like, I am the generation that all these younger people are going to say grandma to, or they're going to mm. come to wisdom to. And if I am not solid in my understanding of the roots, whatever I'm sharing with them is also not solid in them actually finding strength in who they are in terms of their their, their heritage yeah and and, and and the thing that i also accept is 
they're never going to have the experience that I have had. Like you were saying, when we kind of got, you know what, when we were home in my classroom, there used to be 40 students, you'd fight for a seat. You know, if you came in and there was no chair, you had to go look for a chair somewhere else. They're like, what? You had to go for, look for a chair in school. Like it doesn't translate, it doesn't relate. So I'm like, I also acknowledge and accept the, the Australian-ness because the culture that they nurture here is very different from our experience. And, and that's, you know, an acceptable thing, but they are blend. And we also need to do our job as the generation that is embedding life and values into them to embed a little bit. They don't have to take 100% of it, but they just need to take a little bit of that, you know, cultural essence, cultural heritage. They'll mix it up however they want. And at some point, I am very sure every child who has an African background, and I'm talking specifically of African backgrounds, any child at some point when they grow up, whether they like it or not, they come to a realization of like, crap. I am African and they want to connect to it. And we need to be able to say, hey, when they're ready to come and connect, we have a plaster of things for them to connect to. Um, because if we don't, we, we don't keep any of these proverbs or we don't keep any of these kind of like cultural nuances of ours, we are doing a disservice to them. That's how I feel. Like we have no, a yeah, responsibility yeah. to do justice to them when they are ready to come and tap into it. We give them something to tap into. I am in complete agreement with that. And I, I highly support that. It's like, you know, we, it's our responsibility to a great extent because mm -hmm. we already embody these values and these, these, this wisdom that we've carried in us. Now we have to safeguard it and, you know, pass it on in the best way we can. And the, the other thing that, that you, you've touched on there is like, it, it's, you know, they'll ask this question, right? It's like, what do you do, you know, to entertain yourself? And you, you have something you do for entertainment, like I'll watch a movie or I'll listen to some music. You know, what do you do for your exercise, you know, to make sure you're staying fit? Mm. Oh, I'll do this for my exercise. Or what do you do for, you know, motivation or whatever like you have a thing you do yes but then they'll ask the the questions like what do you do for wisdom and that's always a a difficult one it's like you know yeah. people say things like you know i read or what but it's not enough it's like you, you mm. need a collection of things you do to cultivate your wisdom and part of uh, at the very root of that is that the things that make up make you up and some of the things that make you up are really the culture that has shaped you and built you. And I remember like growing up, uh, yeah. we, we, we kind of like dismiss these things. Ah, like, oh, those are things of the old, that's tradition, that's culture. It's not cool. Let's, uh, we don't take- But look at you, seriously. the older you get, then you're like, oh God, that so, made so much sense. I so get it sense. now, I get it now. Now you get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's taken decades. It's taken decades to get to a point. It's like, oh, you know, that thing they were talking about, and that's why they do it that way. Mm. It makes sense. Yeah. Like, I, I was having a chat with a, 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 another friend of mine uh, in Toronto, D David Ivanda. He runs another uh, podcast. Like, his is about African history, and he's uh, taking, like, our stories, like, our, you know, origin stories, and kind of, like, mm -hmm. like really doing a historical study and building that up and producing it in podcast form. It's really interesting. Oh, and that's great. Yeah. So I was talking to him about his work and we're, we're laughing about, you know, when you look at the, uh, like our, you know, traditional marriage ceremonies, right? Mm. People laugh, people try to make jokes of them. Like, you know, it's not cool. It's not modern, but actually when you look at it and, and see like the latest, studies like in science you see like these guys the things they were doing were mitigating problems that science is only catching up to now mm. you know things like looking trying to maintain like uh the blind lineage of like you know this this blind this blood lineage should not intermarry because uh 
problems will happen. You know, that's how they'll present it in, in, in the But you're like, what way. problems? We exactly. don't care like, about problems. <laughs> yeah, you know, but then you get you get you get to this age and you know, people have insurance like, oh yeah, so when there's similarity in, in, in blood history, you get a lot of mutations and then you're going to get a lot of uh you know, all these, you know, neurodiverse cases and yeah. other things related to that because they let the, the bloodlines you know, cross each other. And it's like, oh, so those guys were solving for this problem. It's like, yeah, that's what they were solving for, yeah. but they couldn't articulate it what in a it scientific, was. Yeah. flamboyant yeah. way, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I think that the interesting part, which also goes to like something that I was, I'm wanting to kind of like expand on, is this notion, like you were saying of like, you know, um, growing up you kind of like oh this is old this is you know the, the cultural stuff is and to be honest not everything in the culture should move forward there, there's some things not everything in the culture should move forward but there, there is something about those things being timeless regardless of time so there's some things that have always in over the centuries always made sense always you know even up to now counts. And so what I'm doing next is kind of thinking about the proverbs and also how they relate to today. Because in my head, that's, that's the connection you need to go generation to generation. And I, I think there's one which I've actually written a book about, which is, um, which, which talks about like, days don't rise the same in Shikutashichela Mumo. You know, some days are great, some days are rainy, some days are sunny, da 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 da. And they would always like if you're in trouble or if you're, you know, going through a funeral or, or those types of things, those are the things that they would sit and comfort people with. And that is true, regardless of culture, regardless of who you are, yeah. days are not going to be the same for you. Uh, I think before we jumped on this call, we were talking about the highs of tech and the lows of tech. But that's the truth. It's the truth about the markets. Economic markets are up and down. It's the truth about life. It's up and down. And if you lose that perspective that things are going to get better, it's up and down. You're going to be down in the doldrums for so much longer because mm -hmm. you think this is it. This is the end. It's never going to get better. But if you go back to that proverb and it's just telling you, sure, you're in the doldrums now, it's not going to be forever. It can be days, it can be weeks, it's going to be months, but it's not going to be for forever. At some point, the day will change. At some point, your situation will change. So from that perspective, it doesn't matter what generation you're in, that thing is still true. Uh, yes. And it's something that you can always use for yourself to remind you even in the good times. In the good times, we forget this all. <laughs> You're yeah, just forget, like, I am on the high. Things are great. Life is good. Bougie auntie, living my best life. Hey, your best life is going to finish at some point. <laughs> yep. Not saying your best life finishes, but you're not always going to be on a high. So even in the good times, you have to be aware that at some point, there will be something because that's life. Every day rises differently. And so for me, those are the things I'm like, as much as we kind of like, oh, old people and their wisdom, oh, they're, that are, there's a lot in there that we don't use, which we can use just as a daily motivation. People are doing affirmations day in, I am enough. God, not God is good. I am enough. I have enough. Ha, the people have already told you days don't rise the same. Just use that for the rest of your life. <laughs> it is an affirmation, right? Because you're like, yeah, <laughs> today's a bad day, but hey, tomorrow is going to be different. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think uh, that, yeah. That, that's it, right? Like co co re reclaiming uh, the jewels of our, of our cultures and traditions mm. and polishing them up and uh, modernizing them. There's uh, like uh, this guy in his work, uh, Plato, you know, he writes about that cave where you kind of like you're in a cave and then you have to walk your way out of the cave. Uh, he uses it as a metaphor for, you know, kind of yeah. like becoming wiser or enlightened or whatever way you could characterize it. I feel like we need to kind of uh, 
do a similar type of thing uh, whereby we we reconnect, especially, and I I think this cuts across, like even even back home, like you know, back home in in our home countries. I think this would still be relevant there because you have a lot of young generations uh, aspiring to what they see, you know, trending in the West. And yes. they look up to these things like, oh, that, that's the best thing. That's what we need to aspire to. Mm-hmm. But I think like we need to take our, you know, traditions and our our already well-refined wisdom and show how it's already at par with all the things we're trying exactly. to aspire to. Exactly, yeah. And, and I think what yeah. you're doing in your book, like it's a, it's a contribution to that. And I think we yeah. need to do more of that to, so, so that all this, you know, imposter syndrome, but like, oh no, we, we don't have these things. We don't know what they mean. Oh my God, we need to submit. We need to mm. aspire. That's all the best. That we, we, need to we didn't to have guys. toilets <laughs> because we didn't have toilets. We, we, we were, you know, <laughs> Uh, native people who cares about toilets we've had herbal medicines that were healing people for centuries right our people were not dying for a reason otherwise would have all been wiped out like we were not you know um not saying i don't believe in medical science but i guess the point i'm trying to say is we have had a lot of knowledge and wisdom over the centuries and we have not really carried that power of the knowledge that we have to be something that is of value to us right but you know other cultures western culture has sold everything of theirs and diminished everything of everywhere else that they've colonized and so you know i I do kind of yes i i see there's the power struggles there but i think the key as well for us owning our knowledge is also owning just because you do not have a toilet does not mean you were not healing people does not mean you being a warrior you were not doing other things you were building the great zimbabwe like those types of things you had knowledge you had river systems you had irrigation systems way before anybody came and told you how to do irrigation you know just because somebody comes and says oh you don't know how to do irrigation because you can't do it commercially doesn't mean you were not doing it right you were doing it enough to feed all your people that is knowledge that is wisdom and we should kind of like lean into that power that we had it and we still have it (laughs) we still have it we still have it yeah I was challenging my son. Uh, he's in uh, grade uh, four, and uh, they're starting to learn about history. And I think they they were talking about the Portuguese, and I think I don't remember the, the Spanish and the Portuguese. And you know, he's telling me about Vasco da Gama, and you know, mm. and all the places he discovered. All the places he went and discovered. Yeah, and I'm going like, yeah. how about the natives? Do, do you do you think there were natives there? And so he he noted about that and you know, went back to school. And a few days later, he got back to me. He's like, yeah, they were natives. And, you know, it's like this guy, uh, whatever, what's his name? Is it James Cook? The guy who came to Australia? Yes, yeah. Captain yeah. Cook. Yeah, Captain Cook. And it's like, oh, so, you know, if Cook hadn't come to Australia, then the rest of the world would not have known about Australia. I'm like, yeah, I, I get your point. I, I agree. But it would still yeah. have existed. Yeah, as a but place. it was still here, right? It was still here. Mm. It had a life of its own and life was happening. And he agreed. And he was like, yeah, that is true. And so I like that in their classes now, they're trying to balance it out. It's not mm. like, oh, if it hadn't been for Cook, there would not have been an Australia. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. It was there. Yeah. It was exactly. already there. And yeah. it was if it hadn't been for Livingstone, <laughs> y'all wouldn't have Lake Victoria now, would you? I know, like, li- like Victoria would not exist if Livingstone hadn't, you know, come by and gone, hey, this is great. <laughs> really? Know, right? <laughs> you know? It's like we needed an endorsement. We needed an influencer to come and, you know. Yeah. And tell us that, <laughs> hey, us- you have something here. I've discovered it. Even though you live around it, you use it, you utilize it. Forget that. I've discovered this thing for you. <laughs> I know. I mean, like those are the ancient influencers, you know, all the social media, right? Like they were doing it. It's very <laughs> rudimentary in their way, but 
I think they were doing the same thing. It's like, oh, we have yeah. a celebrity. The celebrity visited, and therefore now that can be. Once the celebrity yeah. says it's real, then we can acknowledge it as being real. Before yeah. that, no. And exactly. Like, oh, and you know how many things that like Victoria, Victoria <laughs> Falls in Zambia as well. From my like Victoria is out there in England, just going yes. I love it. I have a lake in Africa. I have a falls in Africa. I have something in South America. Who knows? Like Victoria is just having a good time in her life. <laughs> and giving you the privilege to use her name. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, but really, I, I think, you know, as a, as a, as a foundation for myself, as a foundation over the years, especially, I think it's that thing when you grow older, you start just coming yourself down and really start thinking about your immortal life, <laughs> not to be more cab or anything, but you start thinking about your immortal life and your legacy and what you're leaving behind. And I think for us, it's important to sit in our power and in our power is our heritage. No matter how, how, you know, people view our heritage and I'm not going to get in the, into the politics of the continent, but I think there's a lot of the continent that makes you not feel proud about who you are because of what is publicly seen, yeah. you know? So for me, it's about, not, not that I don't care about all of that, but it's also about acknowledging that all of that builds us builds our resilience, builds our heritage. And we're not going anywhere. No matter what people, you know, think about, try to do, we are not going anywhere. And we should just sit continually in our power, no matter what. And the first way to kind of find our power is just, yeah, valuing who we are, valuing our ancestors and... Yeah. They did something. They may not have done everything that we wanted them to do, but they did enough for us to take the button and do the next thing. Yeah. And that's as much as we can do. Uh, and also, we shouldn't just leave the button for other people to be giving our kids the button. <laughs> yeah, we should, we should pass it on ourselves. And, and I'm completely... And you know, like the, the certain things that we're still you'd say trending on worldwide, like mm. probably maybe there are other societies doing this well, but we have a strong sense of community, right? Yeah, it's like, definitely. it's, uh, it, it's, and partly like, especially when you move out here to Australia, you, it's such a strange, weird thing. Is, All of a yeah. sudden you feel alone. Right. And you, you, you've never felt this way before. It's like, why do I feel so alone? It's like, yeah, because you're, you know, we have a strong sense of community and mm. you know, there's always everybody in your business, whether you want oh, to the, know. And you hate it. You hate it sometimes because people just freaking turn up the door and you're like, oh my God. But now I'm like, Oof, I wish people would turn we'll up the door because right? otherwise we need to put it in my calendar. Seriously, all my life is calendar. What, what time are you talking about? W which day? Ah, no, that doesn't work. Can we talk? Oh, that doesn't work for you. Okay, how about... Two months later is when we make an appointment. <laughs> I wish people could just come to my door and just hang yeah. out. Um, but yes, the, the sense of like an and connected community. And so much so that not, not that you, you, you have to, uh, there, there's just something as well about the disciplining in, that is communal. The, the, there's things like, you know, you'd walk down somewhere and you're like, oh God, Dang it, that's the auntie, not your blood auntie, but some neighbor who you lived with 10 years ago, now you've moved, but you know if they see you doing something, your mother is going to hear about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> your mother is going to hear about it. And so there's a lot of like communal responsibility. And sometimes yeah. I think about this in this context and I actually have a story that in the book that talks about like, here, who is that person? Who are the people who are going to look out for me in that way, right? It, in the way of like, all right, I see Clayton's kids and I'm like, ah, those little bastards are misbehaving. Hey, auntie's looking at you, behave yourselves just because you're, you know, your dad is not here. 
and but also the 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 vice versa of that is whatever happens to them i'm going to care enough to be like these are clayton's kids i need to do something about them um and we don't build that here as much because in the western world it's very individual it's you and your nuclear family if no one is looking out for you in that nuclear family too bad for you <laughs> too no, bad for it, you it, it is so in this context who, who who is the person who's going to be reaching out for you who's the person who's going to be reaching out for your children right yeah yeah it's you and your wife clayton you tell me like who is it but we can't be enough and, and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're very right and so like you know we realized that as well and so we started to you know start and sort of build a little community like on mm. our street right like mm -hmm. we, we know at least three households which who, which managed to buy in it's like oh we know this neighbor and their children and they come over sometimes and we go yes. over sometimes and the other guys and you know the guy across the and street. you have to be intentional about those things yeah. you have to be yeah. very intentional about building those communities building those relationships yeah. otherwise it's just hi hello the neighbor sees you hi hello and that's it. We have a neighbor who doesn't like talking. I mean, like when I say on our street, we can speak to about three other households. There's like 10 households, right? Mm -hmm. There's like a whole six that don't want anything to do with nah. it. Right. And they say, you guys are noisy neighbors because every mm -hmm. now and then you get on your driveway and the children play together. Come to play to together. Noise. And you go like, but isn't that the whole point of it? That's the whole point. Right? That's the whole point. That's the whole point. And yeah, it, it, it's really been thinking about these things, I think, intentionally as well, because that's, I feel like that's what you need to build because it's not there naturally. Whereas at home, sometimes you just, ah, you remove yourself from the community. <laughs> it's yeah. too much. Um, but here you need to build that community and it's important to be intentional about building that community as well, because as your kids grow, they also need to find their own community. Yeah. And if they have the essence and the model of you doing it, they have the model of, you know, uh, being able to do it. And I would talk about like, you know, and the, these communities in the Australian context have been here longer. So they, you know, Italian communities or mm. Lebanese communities or Chinese communities. Um, they, there's more of them than Africans. So let, let's take that with a pinch of salt. But they are also very intentional in really building their, their, their cultural relationships and making sure their kids speak Italian. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it's broken Italian, they're third generation. They speak Italian, you know, right? The, the third, fourth generation, they will speak Italian how, no matter how broken it is. Um, and for me, I'm kind of like, us as Africans have that model as well. Mm -hmm. We're not that many in population. We're a very small population, but we're starting to grow. There's yeah. so many young people right now who've been born here and grown up here. So we need to be intentional about building our communities. As well. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think we can always, like, there's some activity, like you see, you know, there's uh, every city will have its own small mm. you know, community trying to build up. But I think that intentionality is still missing. It's important. Yeah, it's, and it's needed. And, and also we're trying to build them the way we've always known how to build community and we have those kinds of expectations. But I think we need new techniques. We need to mm -hmm. we need a, a different approach. We need a more modernized version that sort of like is more inclusive. And I, I was trying to pitch this to our community here in uh in the northern side of Queensland. And I was like, look, if you think about it, it's like, you know, we're a small group, right? Like if we mm -hmm. try to set up big events, it's going to be too uh, challenging to always get 
just Ugandans coming up for this, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But but we could make it uh, just a, an event for the general public run by Ugandans. By the Ugandans, so, yeah. Yeah. And so when you do it that way, then it's uh, it's sort of like, first of all, publicizing your heritage as well, mm-hmm. letting the people, the locals know, it's like, oh, there's some Ugandans yeah. who do things a bit different. Uh, but also it's inviting them in to come and participate with your culture and, you know, your activities. And in a way, you're expanding your community. You're also colonizing. Yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> love it. Colonizing, yeah. <laughs> and I think we need to do that. Like we have the opportunity. Yeah. Why not? Right? <laughs> I agree. I, I, I definitely agree. And and that is part of like coming together as an Australian context as well, of like people understanding our culture in the variation where we're also not insular. And like you mm-hmm. were saying, I'm I'm with you. We're not that many. Even if you add all the Africans here, we're not that many. So we can actually use the power of let's get everybody to uh, understand our culture. Let's assimilate. Assimilate is not a good word. but (laughs) Let's really kind of like broaden ourselves by having others come and understand us. And it's not just our thing. It's everybody's thing. Yeah. And it's kind of like, you know, people are like, oh, Diwali, and everybody's excited about Diwali. But, you know, the the Indians have done a good job, (laughs) even though they're a bigger culture. And and obviously, India is a uh, country, it's it's many different, you know, cultures and stuff. But they've done a good job of like, just people kind of like, oh, yeah, Diwali, and, you know, Festival of Lights, and everybody's into it. Um. And I feel like that's where we need to get to at some point. Yeah, and, and I think I think we can, like with intentionality, with some planning. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of like you know festivals we celebrate back home that we can start importing here and sort of publicize mm. and make a big deal about. You know, people love our food, right? It's like, you know, we can make something about that. It's like there's a lot of opportunities for for us to you know, market our cultures, not that we're marketing it, it's like just create, invite other members <laughs> into this culture into, yeah. so that we sort of like, you know, I don't like to, to use the term, but like we have more membership in, in our cultures, even if we don't have the numbers, but we can have more membership. Yes. And, and, and I see that, like, you know, the thing you're speaking about earlier, right? Like where you see, my children, like we have that, it's a very, like in Australia, it's not a thing. It's like you, you mm. go to a children's birthday party, you look out for your child. It, and every time they're going to eat something, you they ha- you, you have to consent to what they're eating, right? And, yeah. <laughs> and so we're at a party and, and the, 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 the Australian guests were kind of going like, oh, you guys don't do that. You just, you just parent all the kids at once. It's like, yeah, because like you're the parent. You, you, yeah. You you decide as a parent what's the right thing for all who for whoever is a child. Exactly. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, we find that doing this around like our neighbors, they're picking up on it too. So now, mm. like when they will see our children misbehaving, or let's say I'm here on a call and my child runs out to the street and my neighbor is out, they're not going to let them. They're going to say, get out of the street. You, that's dangerous for you, right? Yeah. So you shouldn't be playing with a ball there. And before, this was not something they could do, right? Like, yeah. But because we do it for their children. Yeah. I mean, you know, so you've do built it the relationship. <laughs> you've built the, the community where they understand the responsibility um, as well. And that's an interesting one. I, I, I think even went from the context of like, kids and birthday parties and like oh can i eat this you know you shouldn't be eating this no (laughs) not that you're going to be spanking at somebody's kid or anything like that but they know like this is the adult and this adult has a similar authority to my parents you know and if i want something i can go to them and say hey can i get this um type of thing but it's a it's a, it's a different way, like communal raising kids it, it, is just in certain cultures. <laughs> no, it's a, yeah, it's very different. And it, it takes a bit of uh, 
demonstration, but I think it catches on mm. easy. And so like, that's why if we start to, you know, like we're saying before, like open up, inviting, you know, more mm. membership, then it starts to become a thing. Because also in those other like communities, like let's say the Lebanese community or the Indian community, you get to see a bit of that. Like we're very much similar in terms of, it's kind of like communal societies get this, Yes. Right. And yeah. individualistic societies do not get this. But Don't get it at blend. all. Yeah, we can yeah. make a blend and then everybody can start to get a bit of each. It's like, oh, that's why you guys don't like dealing with this because it's too much. So your survival technique is like, no, nah, I'm not going to be bothered with anybody's children. I'm just going to try and solve for my ones, right? <laughs> try oh, and solve can... for me. <laughs> yeah, try and solve for me. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's like the different strategies solving the same problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I am. I, I guess because we've been talking about culture and heritage, I'm curious. Like, from your perspective over the last couple of years in Australia, what is it that you do that kind of like connects you to your roots? Oh, that's a good aside question. from like, oh, I go home. <laughs> what no, What is a- it? What is it that connects you to, you know, your, your culture and your heritage? What I noticed, and it's not me, this one, I this, I'm just writing on what my wife does. Uh, and for the longest time I was in protest of this. So I'm very, very <laughs> guilty. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, she would you know, make friends of other Ugandan families in the area and like really get to know them. And every time something is happening, she would drag us along. Come on, let's go. There's a birthday happening at so-and-so's house. Come on, let's go. There's, you know, something happened or we're just going to have dinner with them. And then people would come over. Oh, we're preparing. We're inviting people over for this. And so I'm not a very, you'd say, out there person. I just like my mm. space and my little cocoon. Yeah. Just wanna hide. Uh, <laughs> but this kind of like, she pushed me out of my comfort zone. And slowly after going a bit, you know, the first few times I was just complaining, this is a waste of time. I don't know these people. How do I relate to them? And, mm. you know, thinking all sorts of things. But then as you keep going, it starts to grow and you're like, Oh, no, no, no. Every time I'm here, we eat our Ugandan food. We Mm. listen to some Ugandan music. You see the children play together. And he's like, oh, that's really nice. You you get, it's like you create a little corner of Uganda where, you know, thousands of miles away. Yeah. and, And you get a bit of that. And you come back feeling lighter, feeling better. And you don't know why you're feeling lighter, feeling better, but it's because of all this connectedness you're enjoying. And so once, I think like after like a couple of years of going to those things, then it it clicked for me. I was like, oh no, this is why it was so important for her. This is why we're doing it. So now I'm I'm on board. Now I'm the champion for it. It's like whether... (laughs) Well done, wifey. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like sometimes... Uh, you know, she'll have like a work Ooh. shift and she can't go. Like, I'll go to the children. We'll go. We'll be there. We will represent for this house, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and slowly, it's uh, it's a thing. It's great. Like, the, we have a little sub-community, like, of just men getting together and just hanging out a mm. bit. It's meant to be going for runs to do exercise. I can't make most of the running time. But we have a little community where people can just talk, ask difficult questions about what they're mm. dealing with. And so there's these little spaces growing of just people connecting and, you know, helping each other out in whichever way you can, but mostly for, for the communal support. It's like, oh, I lost somebody, you know, like this family lost someone, uh, let's support them. And we have this tradition back home, if, if you lose someone, uh, we'll collect money or give you food. This yes, just give yes, you some money, yes, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give some yeah. money to support you. Well, yeah, it's the little we the could same. contribute, right? You know, uh, mm. or we'll come around your house and you know light a fire, sit around mm. and and have mm. a chat and just keep you company. And so th- there is, the, you said there that's growing a lot and mm. it's becoming a thing. And you 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 find that the children now believe the other children in the community to be their sisters and brothers Mm. 
in that they just they just don't have to think about it because they always see them they know where these people live and then when when too much time has gone by without seeing them it's like oh i want to go see my sister so and so and mm. then you have to arrange it arrange the yeah to make it happen but it's it's slowly seeping in and slowly growing and now yeah. for me i'm i'm going on you know trying to see how now do we import more of the culture things for the children you know how do we pass on the yes. languages you know uh i was looking there at is a Lingo, language right? school <laughs> wait there is a language school so you people need to add your language um into the language school so there's oh, yeah, the I, saw, I saw you post australian yeah. yeah language school so what are they doing they do swahili Igbo, um bemba nyanja and zulu i think hmm. uh so y'all need to add your language to it <laughs> Yeah, totally. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's a, uh, you know, um, Duolingo. If Duolingo has it, that's a way to do it as well. Yeah. Now I was looking at their, at their platform. Apparently you can add languages, but it's a whole other process. You have to build a forum and get people interested. Like you have to petition Duolingo to feel that this so is actually there's a need yeah yeah there's a need so, for it yeah. so they can it's a business product. you know it's a business they need to market it right so if, yeah. if the demand is not there they, they're not going to supply it. yeah 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 and i think what you were saying they kind of like the intentionality is important as well because i still think a lot of our kids are the only ones in their schools in their classes and so if they have, you know, they, they have a, oh, I want to go and see my sister, so-and-so, they, they, they also have that connection that in those spaces, they're not the only ones. Mm. In those spaces, they're anybody at that point yeah. in time, right? Um, and I think those spaces are important for our kids. Um, oh, yeah. until, you know, until all our schools are as diverse as we want them to be, we, we have to give them an opportunity to, um, be in places where it's not just them because yeah. we've learned how to navigate this, right? That the older we are in the workplaces, you know, a lot of the times it's always just going to be you and we've learned how to navigate this as adults. So this is why all those different journeys start coming into light. Like, you know, I've learned it as an adult. I was a late teen when I came, but I was a late teen. It's different to starting when you're that young, right? When you're young and you're always othered, you're young and you're always othered. If you've had a chance not to have been othered and you get to a space where you are and you're like, okay, but you, you know the feeling, right? Of yeah. not being and for me, kids in those places, like you were talking about when they're playing together, they're not other, they're just yeah. kids. They're not the black kid. They're not the African kid. They're, they're not, they're just a kid. Um, and I, I just wish for more places where they're just kids. Yeah. I, <laughs> no, to, um, totally agree yeah. with that. And I think we, we have to, we have to invest in that. And intention yeah the intention would really help us shape it properly and you know and and you know with even the technology advancing right like even yes let's say we could start like by just doing video calls where kind of yeah like hold a space where people can kind of like it's not much but um it still gives you that sense of connectedness because that's what mm -hmm. you really need and it puts away that you know, that otherness, right? That you're always yeah. carrying, right? And and so once you can fall into a space whereby, ah, I just feel like me. And and I'm I don't feel like I'm sticking out like a sore thumb. But there's okay. nothing here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing here. And and that's a great feeling, right? I yeah. I think it's also the feeling that we get when we go home. Because yeah. I feel like every time I go home, I am completely a needle in a haystack. I could be anybody and nobody would know. Like I could be anybody walking down the street and I just 
disappear. Mm -hmm. Um, And in those moments, I'm like, yeah, because, you know, I I think I've, I've, it's very free. I've been in Australia long enough that I'm able to mask things that I actually don't care about. But, you know, and over the years now, it's a lot better. But there, there would be days in my earlier years when I would be like, you'd walk through the city, you'd go to like, you know, go a whole journey an hour and you literally would not see another black person. Like at all, in any space, on the train, on the tram, in the office. And you're just kind of like, wait, <laughs> you know? Um, and you learn to mask that and just be like, that's what it is. You, you, you roll with it. Uh, and I remember like the first time I, I went to a Western country where I did not feel that I was in the UK. I went to the UK to kind of visit students and I jumped off the plane. It was my first time in the UK and I, I caught the tube. I was catching the train cut the tube and I was just like wait what is this what is this feeling (laughs) because there were so many black people on the train and I had in my head I had a really wonderful time of not feeling othered in that place Mm -hmm. because I there was just so many people like me I just felt like I could get lost here and it, it you know could be fine And that was a feeling I hadn't felt after having lived so many years in Australia at that point anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I thought about friends of mine who'd come even earlier than me. I moved in 2004, earlier than 2004, the people were coming in 2000, late 90s. And I was like, how are you people surviving? So that's why I, you know, you, you can see my passion for community, my passion for connection, because yeah. I just, I want us all at some point to just not have otherness feeling on us. I just want us to just be people, man. And yeah, we, we just need to that's be. That's it. <laughs> That's it. I, I, you know, as that, that you say that, and I was walking in the, we were walking in the mall the other day. And then this other guy, like, you know, he's, uh, he looks like he's African and his partner is not. And so they're walking and he, he nods at me, you know, the, the, head the, the, me, right? the nod. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. I, and, I, and I nod back. And then my wife was like, who is that? He's like, I don't know. It's like, just a guy. It's like, it's like, hey, it's a thing. It's a, it's a thing. It's an, it's an, it's an I see you. Like, I see you. I see you, you too. Right? Like, so that, <laughs> that, that's sort of like trying to shake someone else uh, out of yeah. the otherness, right? Yeah. And, yeah. 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 yeah, and yeah, when, yeah. When, when we had just arrived, I think like it was like three days here and we're trying to figure out the way to the mall, right? And this guy drives past us at the traffic lights. And he's a, he's a cab driver and he shouts out of the cab and, you know, he's like, Hey, I see you, my people, I see you. And he's driving through the street and we wave back at him and he was so happy. Like he kept <laughs> shouting it down the street. I was like, so now when you say you, you go across the whole country and back without seeing anyone, I think I get that. It's like, it sits yeah. with you. And when you see it somebody, you want to let it out. And, go, and then oh. when you see somebody, you're like, Oh my God. That, that, how exciting is this? It's like a kid in a candy shop because you're like, oh, I, I'm not alone. I, I, there is more to me. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, that, that, that is a feeling that for me, I feel like our generation of migrants ha- ha- has had to go through this. I, I want our kids not to go through. I just want our kids to be kids, man. Like, you know. Uh, don't don't ask them, you know, where, where are you from in Africa? I don't care. <laughs> does it matter? <laughs> Why does no, it, it matter? <laughs> it shouldn't. <laughs> uh, but also when that question is asked, I want them to answer that with pride and, and, yeah. and be proud about their heritage and what they, their ancestors have achieved, what they're going to achieve. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we, we, we have a lot of work to do. And sometimes the work is tiring, Clayton. I, I would not lie. The, the spirit gets crushed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I would not give it to the man. I, I would not allow the man to, uh, to take anything from our power. 
don't, we don't have amazing un- power. Yeah, we do. And look, you you have support and we're all here for you. And look, mm-hmm. you just have to keep doing this good work. And I'm I'm gonna ask you, so like, you know, so in your in your upcoming works, right? Like what is I, I know you you're tackling to more around this subject, uh, but what should we anticipate? And you know, is it gonna be I don't know. Like, I, I, I'm curious. Like, are you working on some more stuff? <laughs> I am working on some more stuff, uh, but Chat G- GPT ha- ha- has to hold itself back <laughs> before so I can finish and then it can dis- dismantle everything that I'm putting into the world. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I think the, the things that I'm working on, I, I was actually. Uh, thinking about this, I, I was like, I want to, um, I probably, my writing is very emotional writing and, and it's, it, it, it's emotional, quirky writing. I love it that way. I'm trying to write a, a fully happy story. <laughs> mm. That's my challenge to myself, whether that work gets published or not is, is something else, but that, that's, that's my challenge to just, you know, um, a story that has no race in it. Because I think a lot of the, the stuff that I've produced lately has a, and, and needingly so, has, has, has race as the center. Um, so I want to just write a happy-go-lucky story that is just a happy-go-lucky story. That's mm. a challenge to myself. Uh, but also in the immediate future, it is just a lot more of that. Let's get the wisdom and let the wisdom from the ancestors guide our value guide what we do and let's be proud of um the power that is in us and the power that is in our heritage so i'm actually kind of i've been building this for the last couple of months um going out of the context of zambia so if you have some ugandan proverbs send them my way because that's what I'm doing. I'm going out of the context of Zambia and just touching on a couple of different African uh, countries and their proverbs, and then really writing some stuff around that in relation to life today. Uh, That's great. That's my next thing. Yes, please. Yes. And because I kind of, I want the genuine ones, because not the genuine, like the ones that are actually, uh, I'm sourcing them from friends, from people that I know, because I want them to have a meaning to someone else as well and have that connection. Um, I, I can grab as much as I can from the internet, but to me, that doesn't have the connection of like, this is Clayton's one. It came from Clayton. Clayton has learned this from it. And so when I draw that inspiration, it comes from that space. Yeah. Um, so that's the next project. I've been gathering a couple. I probably have four that I'm working with at the moment. So give me some uh, as well. Oh, oh definitely. I'd be, I take this very seriously. It's such an honor. And Yes. <laughs> You'll get a special mention in my book at some point. You'll be at the acknowledgement. <laughs> No, that's great. That's great. I'll definitely put something together for you. <laughs> oh, well, we've been speaking for a while. And thank you so much for joining me, my essay. And it was uh, a blast. It's already an hour. I feel like we could go for a few more hours. Oh, we could go for the whole night, but we need our beauty sleep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll have to pick it up from here maybe another time. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, I'll end it there unless you have some few final thoughts to share. Um, yeah. No, thank you for having me. It's been good. We, we, we entered in different spaces and places, but we've just come back. Ultimately, it's about, you know, I, I love my people. I love myself. Uh, it's hard to acknowledge that you love yourself, but it's important to love yourself. And important to love your ancestors, no matter how the world sees them. Our ancestors are amazing and we have so much power within us. Mm. Um, And we should always remember the power that we have within us. So if, you know, uh, we can end on that note of like the power within has come from ancestors before us. And we are the ancestors of the next generations. 
So we should take that responsibility as, you know, hold it with both hands because it's a huge responsibility. But, you know, we, we got this. <laughs> yeah, we got this. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Clayton.